especially in the rainy season when we are having so many failures and uh, so many disasters due to this lightning and earthing failures so today we are having a very very uh, important webinar based upon the earthing and lightning protection systems that is going to be represented by uh, shri stanley mendes who is vice president of hex experience so i am sure that uh, this presentation is again going to be very very helpful for all the participants who are using uh, these earthing systems uh, in the field so before uh, starting with the presentation i again welcome mr stanley mendes he is vice president of hex, hex bombay so uh, he will be presenting and uh, in the presentation we are also having some videos to have uh, this uh, experience that how this uh, earthing and lightning takes place and how we can protect our system so now i request uh, mr stanley mendes to please start with your presentation thank you thank you mr garg for that introduction uh, good evening everyone let me introduce uh, the team here today I have with us uh, our director, Mr. Manish Desai, the director of Grass Copper and Alloy India Limited. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Uh, before we go on to the presentation of uh, earthing and lightning protection systems, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar. Thank you for taking time out from your daily schedule to be with us today. So let me share a few details about our company before we go on to the webinar on earthing and lightning protection systems. Well, the name of our company is Brass, Copper and Alloy India Limited. Our brand name, we are, we are mostly known by the name, which is X. This is our logo. We have been an ISO certified company since the last 19 years or so. Well, just to give you a brief history about X was established in 1991. The dream of a young man, Mr. Manish Desai then. It all started you know, in a small area a small area of just 1,000 square feet with just eight workers and a 20 ton press. The turnover in that year, I believe, was about uh, 1 lakh rupees or so. Uh, as the years flew by, it began to grow very rapidly. And as we prepare to celebrate our 30 years, 30 years of completion this year, we are proud uh, of the growth that we have achieved. And now X operates from 20,000 square meters approximately. We have an annual turnover of 1,125 crores. And Hexes turns were very well-known brand name, not only nationally, but also in, in globally around the world. Well, our vision is to be one of the top 10 global suppliers by 2025. And I must say we are proud that we have already achieved this target as far as Earthing and lightning protection systems are concerned. We are at seventh place globally as per the report released, the global report on marketing uh, that has been released by uh, this vision for 2019. And our mission is basically to keep all our stakeholders satisfied with the just in time delivery and Also, to ensure that we generally have a minimum impact on our environment. So, what does Hex manifest? This table gives you a comprehensive idea of our monthly production: five tons of copper lugs and inline connectors. Okay, and. Uh, this is produced by using machinery in various states of automation. Some are fully automated, some are semi-automated. And we also, then the next product is earthing electrodes. We produce about 150 tons per month of different types of earthing electrodes, right from the diameters of 12 millimeters to about 2 millimeters for the non-solid copper bonded earth rods. 
And of course, pipe in pipe as required, that is 76 dia, 50 dia of lengths of having lengths of one, two, and three meters. These are the standard products that we may manufacture normally. And the copper plating, as per the thickness desired by the customer, is uh, done in our in house copper plating plant. Both the tin and copper plating plants are connected to the ETB plants, of course, and uh, everything is uh, processed as per the uh, Gujarat Pollution Control Boards. Then we have the ground enhancing chemical compounds. Of course, sorry, before that, we have the uh, brass cable glands and copper alloy components, which is produced by an associate company in Jamnagar, 50 tons approximately. Ground enhancing chemical compounds, 100 tons. And earth pit chambers, ready to use earth pit chambers, 5,000 uh, numbers per month in, uh, of concrete and polymer. And we have our own ESC lighting arrester, which is called, this has been designed and developed by us here in India. Moving on. Some of the standards that our cable lugs are, you know, uh, that we follow to produce our cable lugs. These are national and international. ISO A3009 is the Indian standard for aluminum lugs and inline connectors. Um, of course, there is no Indian standard for cable lugs. It's only for, this is for connectors, for aluminum. There is no standard for copper cable lugs. And then there is IEC 61238, which is the international standard. Most of our products have been tested as well. Then as for the standard, we all know that. NZ, NZ is for Australia and New Zealand. UL is for lugs to be supplied to the US and CSA for Canada. And SABS is for South Africa, and Senelec is for the Netherlands. Some standards to which our glands comply. The BS612 is for glands that we uh, export all over the world. Flame proof as per IEC 60079, weather proof as per IEC 60529, and explosive proof glands which we manufacture as per EN. 60079. Some standards to which are earthing and lightning protection systems comply. IEC 62561, that is of course the testing standard for IEC 6230. Then NFC 17 is for our ESC lightning arrestors. And again, UL and CSA for the UL product. But many people in India have been asking us to supply the products as per UL. Well, that was a brief description about our company. I could go on and on, but since the main topic is waiting for us, so let us go ahead with earthing and lightning protection systems. From the highest point to the lowest point and everything in between, X can provide optimum solutions for your lighting protection requirements. LA is or the lightning arrester at the highest point. We will begin from there and then travel to the lowest point, which is the earthing. So, what is lightning? Before we go into lightning protection systems, what is lightning? Well, as you can see in the graphic, there is something coming down from the clouds and something meeting it from the from the uh, structure over there, and when they join together, we can see lightning happening. All right, so this is a simple definition of lightning. But let us see why does this phenomena occur. Clouds are basically made up of fine ice crystals and dust particles and water. And this, these three things, they form something called soft hail, which is also called grockle. Now, due to the updraft and low temperatures ranging from about minus 15 to minus 25, the ice crystals are carried towards upwards and the denser grapple tend to fall or are suspended. Okay, so when the rising ice crystals collide with grapple, the ice crystals become positively charged and the grapple becomes negatively charged. The updraft carries the positively charged ice crystals upwards towards the top of the storm cloud. The larger and denser grapple is either suspended in the middle of the storm cloud or it falls towards the lower part of the storm. 
Now the positive charge is when they accumulate towards the top of the cloud and the negative charge is towards the bottom of the cloud, okay? This is what happens. They create a pull effect on the ground below. Now this in turn, it creates positive charges to accumulate in the region of the ground which is below this cloud. So the ground starts sending up the positive charges towards the negative charges that are coming down from the cloud. And when the streamer that can rise you now, and so the ground will send an upward streamer to meet the downward leader. These are the terms that are used. So the streamer can rise up through either a building or a tree to maybe any person who is standing in the vicinity. And when these, the downward leader and the upward streamer meet, it creates a blinding flash of lightning. So a simple definition of lightning would be that it is a visible discharge of static electricity that takes place at three places inside the cloud. It takes place inside the cloud, that is cloud to cloud, then from that is intra cloud between one cloud to another cloud, and the third region is from the cloud to the ground. Now, of these three, all these three uh, lightnings that are taking place, only approximately 5% of lightning that is cloud to ground is only about 5%. 95% approximately takes place in the first two regions, that is within a cloud or from cloud to cloud. Okay, so what happens to the positive charges? When they get saturated, they do send a downward leader. Now the ground will then send a charge of the opposite polarity, that is a negative upward streamer to meet it. Now this is said to be less than 5% of all lightning strikes and it is approximately six times stronger than the negative lightning. And it is also very destructive. This is sometimes called, you know, is a term that is called the bolt from the blue. So this is something like that. But to understand lightning better, I will show you a short video from Discovery Channel. Uh, Mr. Stanley, uh, there yes. is no audio. Audio is missing. Is it? Okay, I'll just stop and I'll try again. Just hold on, please. Lightning will strike everything that stands out in the ground. Trees are a favorite target. Lightning runs through the trees, snap instantly vaporizing. A strip of bark can explode like wooden shrapnel and travel upward at lethal speeds. lightning's jagged path or why it chooses to strike in one place rather than another all we do know is that the path is first created by a trickle of electricity that rushes outward from a charged region high inside the cloud it begins as a small spark inside the cloud five miles up a spurt of electrons rushes out travels a hundred meters 
stops and pools for a few millionths of a second. Then the stream lurches off in a different direction, pools again and again. Often the stream branches and splits. This is not a lightning bolt, yet it's called a stepped leader, an intensely charged channel leaping and branching down. As it gets close, its electric field begins to exert a pull on the ground. When that step leader is within 10 or 100 meters of the ground, the ground is now aware of there being a big surplus of negative electricity, which has come down on a conductor. Certain objects on the Earth respond by launching little streamers up toward the step leader. Uh, weakly luminous plasma filaments, which are trying to connect with what's coming down. If you happen to be standing there, maybe a streamer is going to leave your head and, and, and head toward that step leader. A telephone pole might launch a positive streamer. A blade of grass might launch a positive streamer up toward the step leader. It's that special one which makes the connection, which gives rise to the return stroke and then this, this catastrophic 10,000 ampere current flows. That, that closes the switch. When that connection is made, the electrons drain to Earth in a blinding bolt of light. The part of the channel nearest the ground will drain first, then successively higher parts, and finally the charge from the cloud itself. So the visible lightning bolt moves up from ground to cloud as the massive electric currents flow down. These positive streams only exist Two streamers left the treetop, but only one of them successfully connected with the descending stepped leader. A nearby telephone pole also launched a positive streamer upward, a failed lightning bolt. Well, I hope that video gave you a better idea of how lightning happens. If you have any questions, please write them down and we can answer them during the question and hour session. Well, moving on, some facts about lightning. The estimated peak power per lightning stroke is 1000 gigawatts. The total energy in a large thunderstorm is thought to be enough to power the whole of the USA for about 20 minutes. According, yes. According to the National Severe Storm Laboratory, a single lightning bolt can have about 100 million to 1 billion volts. And an average lightning strike discharges about 30,000 amperes. And the current in a lightning stroke typically ranges from about 5,000 to 50,000 amperes, depending on the, on the strength of the storm. Now, NASA has recorded strikes of 100,000 amperes. And there are other reports of strikes which are over 200,000 amperes. Now, a bolt of lightning can reach up to, uh, say, uh, roughly 30,000 degrees centigrade. This is about five times the temperature of the sun. Now, it also travels about 6,000 kilometers per minute, per second, sorry. And lightning strikes the Earth approximately 44 times per second. Uh, there are about uh, 1.4 billion flashes to the earth per year. So these are some facts about lightning. Now getting back to, the, to India, you know, these are the number of thunderstorm days um, in the, I've taken off uh, from five zones, east, west, north, south, and central. Now we had the earlier report that was IS-2309-1989. Then a report from Mr. Ajit Tyagi who was, uh, was released in 2007 regarding the number of thunderstorm days. You can see the percentage of increase in each zone. 31.4% for uh, the east zone, 132% nearly for west, 40% for north, 76 for south and central about 46 to 47%. Now this, if you make an average of this, it comes to about 65%. So in the last 18 years, the the thunderstorm days in India have increased uh, tremendously, exponentially, I would say. Okay, now uh, there is also another report 
that from 2019 to 20 to March April 2019 to March 2020, there were 13.8 million strikes in India, and between April 2020 and March 2021, there were about 18.5 million strikes. So 13.8 to 18.5, this itself is about 34% increase in just one year. The government has taken a very, very, you know, a serious note of this. And uh, it has come out with a very new campaign. Just look at this slide. It shows the percentage of deaths occurring in India due to lightning. Only lightning is the highest killer of people. So the government has taken a serious note, like I was saying, and they have launched this campaign called the Lightning Resilient India campaign. Now, their aim is to uh, reduce human deaths by 80% next three years. This was started in 2019. And they have really, they said they have come very, very close to this. How will, how will they do this? By awareness programs, then early warning system, and lightning protection system. Just look at this very, very simple reason, the primary causes for lightning death. We were always, I remember when we were young, we were told that lightning occurs, go and stand under the tree. But this is the primary cause of lightning. Please tell, educate everyone not to do this, not to stand under a tree whenever there is lightning. Now, this is the father. I'm talking about the third point of how they will do is lightning protection system. This is where we come in. So how do we protect ourselves from lightning? We install a lightning protection system. Very simple to say that. But what are the basic components of a lightning protection system? I'm sure you will all know this. Air terminals, also called as aerial rods or lightning arresters. Mast assembly on which the lightning arrester is installed. Down conductors, which provide a safe path for the lightning to be grounded earthing components which will disperse the lightning strike into the earth and fittings or accessories that are used to connect all these components. These are the simple way of describing a lightning protection system. So what is a lightning arrestor or an air terminal? It is just a metallic device which is mounted at the highest point so that there is a safe path to channelize the lightning strike that is you know, if there is no lightning uh, arrestor, there is bound to be a disaster. If there is no safe path, there will be a very, very tremendous disaster. Moving on, what are the types of air terminals or lightning arresters that are there today? What we have as X, we have the passive and the active lightning. What are passive? Passive are the conventional Franklin rods, you know, conventional rods or Franklin rods. They come in single point or multiple point models. We have them in copper or copper bonded steel, brass and solid copper. Now in the active range, we have our early streamer emission of e or ESCLAs. Now this is the current 60 model, which is a second generation ESCLA. It is purely mechanical and has been designed and developed as here in India, like I said earlier. Then we have Satellite 3 model, which is manufactured by Dual Mason of France. The All India distributorship is held by one of our group companies for this Satellite 3 model. It comes in three models, which I will describe later. Now, this is an electromechanical uh, device. Hence, it can generate its own charges and doesn't depend on the ground charges. It has batteries which are charged by the solar cells, as you can see, which are fixed on the outside of its body. Now, these batteries have a life cycle of approximately seven years. It comes with its own tele-tester. You can see that small remote-like instrument next to it. That is a tele-tester. This handheld device help, helps us to remotely check whether this instrument is working or not. By the way, it also self-checks every 90 seconds. So this is the beauty of Satellite 3. Both these types of lightning arresters have their own standards. The Franklin rods are governed by IEC, ISIC 62305, which is a series of four parts. And NFC is for the early streamer emission devices. 
Uh, talking about IEC 62305, the four parts, it talks about the threat of lightning, part one. Um, the threat is to the source, the source of the damage, the type of damage, and the type of loss that can occur due to the lightning threat. Now, part two will deal with the risk management. What are the risks involved to the people, to the service, risk of loss to a maybe cultural heritage or loss of economic value? Now, we have our own uh, software to calculate the risk based on all the inputs that we ask from you. Then part three, it deals with the methods that can be used to design a lightning protection system. And of course, part four is it deals with protection from indirect lightning hazards. Both standards have classified uh, lightning protection into four levels. That is levels one, two, three, and four. These four levels are defined by the intensity of the lightning current in the thunderstorm. The number of thunderstorm days for any region can be taken from the Tiagi, uh, Tiagi report, which I had shown earlier. Now, the IMD, the Indian Meteorological Department, is in the process of mapping the current lightning intensity all over India. And they should be releasing their report as soon as it is ready. Now, based on these four LPLs or lightning protection level, both these standards have classified lightning protection system into four corresponding types. So each lightning protection level will have level one LPS, level two LPS, level three LPS, and level four LPS. Let us see the three methods. IEC 62305 states that we can use three methods to uh, design the lightning protection system. That is the RSM or rolling spear method. The second is the mesh method. And the third is the protective angle method or PAM as it is called. Let us see how these three methods can be used. Now, the method one, RSM, states that an imaginary, large imaginary sphere or a ball, it rolled surface of the entire structure to be protected. It has to be rolled in all directions. It's easier said than done. Now, whenever, wherever the ball touches the structure, that area needs to be protected, as you can see from the slide. So the radius of the sphere is as what is given in the table, according to the lightning protection level. So if I use a, a lightning protection level one, you have to roll a sphere of 20 meters radius, Level 2 is 30, level 3 is 45, and level 4 is 60. But to understand this better, here is a small animated video. So you can just, there is no audio to it, just have a look of how it works. So huge, huge sphere is just being rolled over the, the structure that needs protection. There is no audio to this, okay? So as it rolls, you can see where it is touching, it's creating red spots. Now this is a part of a software. Can you see the red spots? This is where, where it, the, the sphere touches. Now these areas need protection to protect the whole structure. Now as you can see, we have installed the lighting arrestors, the conventional lighting arrestors. We can see them all over as per the lighting protection design, system design. And then once over, after doing that, when we roll the sphere once again, we can see that everything is turning from red to green. Can you see that? Everything is green now. So this structure has been protected by using the rolling sphere method. Now this is something that we uh, used, uh, uh, the rolling sphere method we used to design for a solar array protected from lightning strikes. Another drawing which shows uh, where we used it for protecting an observatory. Just to give you some examples. Now moving on to the next method, which is the mesh method. This states that the entire structure should be covered with a mesh of conductors with lightning arrestors and down conductors placed at specific locations. Now this method is generally used for uh, flat roofs. 
for tall buildings, the sides also have to be covered by the mesh. Now, the size of the mesh which must be used is given for all the four lightning protection levels. So for the first uh, level, it is five by five. The square will be five by five as shown in the drawings and so on and so forth. Now getting on to the last method, that is the third method, which is the protective angle method. Now this method gives the angle that must be used to design the lighting protection system. The cone that is formed, this is the cone, as you can see, which is formed here. This is the lighting arrester, the cone that is formed as per the particular angle, which is given in the standard. The circle that defines the base of the cone is the area that is protected by one single lighting arrester. Now, but if you see, it also takes into account the reference plane. Now here, there is only one reference plane, but in this figure, you can see that the reference plane changes. Now, even though the lighting arrester is installed here, this becomes a reference plane, and for this, it, this side becomes a reference plane. So the angle changes accordingly. Okay, now we can see that in the third figure, how the representation is made graphically and how many numbers are required as per this cone of protection by using the protective angle method. Well, this is the table that the standard gives. So if a height of one meter, you can, for level one, the angle is 70 degrees. For level two also, it's 70 degrees, sorry, for two meters. Hello? Uh, I request to all the participants, please mute your uh, mic, please. All the participants, please mute your mic. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Gard. But this, this method, as you can see, is derived by using the rolling sphere, is derived from using that, that calculation. Okay, moving on. Now, this is a, uh, sorry, this is a structure that we are designed for, the beautiful looking structure. This is a university that is coming up. Uh, we use both the methods for this. We had to use uh, the mesh method. But the whole structure was covered with a mesh of eight by eight meters. And also we use the, the PAM method, the protective angle method. And where we had to use, I think about 44 to 50 lighting, conventional lighting arresters. And everywhere there were down conductors coming down. So you can use these methods in combination to uh, design your lightning protection system. This is what we do. Well, that was about the conventional lighting arrester. Now let's move on to the early streamer emission terminals. Let us see what does the NFC 17 standard state. What exactly is an air early streamer emission air terminal? It simply defines the ESC as an air terminal that generates a streamer earlier than a simple rod air terminal when compared in the same conditions. Now the difference in streamer emission time between both the ESC air terminal and the single rod air terminal measured in the lab under the same conditions is expressed in microseconds and it is called as delta T. Now, these are the typical components of an ESC lighting protection system. The LA or the air terminal is fitted on the top of the mast as per the required height given in the standard. Then you have the down conductor, which provides a safe part of the grounding of the lightning strike. Now this could be uh, either a bare GI or you know a copper strip mounted on appropriate insulators or an insulated copper cable. Now in between there is a lightning strike counter, which counts the number of strikes that have taken place on the LA. Just beneath the lightning strike counter, uh, we have installed you know our uh, what do you call a test joint? A test joint. This is like a safety device which is used, you know, when you have to disconnect the earthing system for any maintenance work. Now, if a bare conductor has been used, then you require a protective sheet up to a certain height for safety of the occupants. And last, we have the earthing system. The standard recommends that three earth pits must be installed for each LA, but also states that at least in, a, in adverse condition, at least two earth pits must be installed. 
Now, the standard also states that if the height, the overall height of the structure is more than 28 meters, then two down conductors must be installed for each LA, and each down conductor must have two or three earth pits each. Now, this is the table given by the NFC standard for the radius of protection provided by each ESE LA. So, if the tip of the ESE is installed at the height of 5 meters from the highest point of the structure, for level 1, both the Satellite 3 and the Taran 60 models will provide a radius of protection of 79 meters. And everything that is within that circle is protected. Similarly, for level 2, it will be 86 meters. For level 3, 97 meters. And for level 4, 107 meters. So each instrument can provide you as per the lightning protection level. These radiuses of protection, just one instrument. Now, there is, we all know what is the structure, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Now, there is just one EAC LA that is protecting the world's tallest structure from lightning strikes. And we are proud to inform you it is none other than the Satellite 3 model. Now, we were lucky enough to have the famous Hollywood actor sitting there, you know, during a shooting of the Mission Impossible movie Ghost Protocol. Now, Sat 3s, you can clearly see it. You know, uh, when he climbed up there during or maybe after his shooting. Now, recently we were happy once again because Emirates released this ad where a beautiful air hostess climbed up there at the topmost point, you know, and someone said to her that she is the highest person on the planet. So, my friends, we are not advertising for Emirates Airlines here. What excited us was that Sat 3, Satellite 3, was again in the limelight. It is the highest EAC on the planet. But I want to draw your attention to this video grab of one of the lightning strikes that has captured, you know, that was captured by Satellite 3. See how the lightning strike has gone below the level of the tip of the Satellite 3. But still it has been prevented from striking the Burj Khalifa. So this is very important to note. So how strong this, this instrument is, this lightning arrester is. Well, for those of you who have not seen uh, the lightning strikes, here is a short video showing lightning strikes striking the Burj Khalifa. So we are very proud that the Satellite 3 is protecting the tallest structure in the world. Now just to give you a cost comparison between a passive and an active system, you know, for the same uh, size of structure, 60 meters by 40 meters width and 20 meters height. As per our calculation that this is the cost, that is 3.75 lakhs, whereas for a single EAC system, which is good enough to protect this structure, it comes to just about 1.65 lakhs. Moving on. Well, lightning protection. Now, uh, let us take a look at the earthing, where all of you will know the simple definition of earthing. I'm sure you'll know that it is just a process of creating an alternative path for the flow of fault or excessive current safely in the ground in the presence of minimal resistance. These are the standards that we follow for designing our earthing system IEC 80 2013. BS7340-2011 and IS3043-2018. All the calculations are done as per the formula that is given in these standards. So basic data required for designing an earthing system. What we require the soil resistivity value with the month of measurement. Then then we have, sorry, a uh, uh, maximum temperature in summer. Why do we require it in summer? Why do we ask the soil resistivity value with the month of measurement? Because we always know that the 
resistivity value or the earth pit resistance is always the worst in the summer season. So whenever we have, we have the value in a particular month, we can extrapolate it and calculate it what it would be in the summer season. Then we also ask for a bore log data of six meters depth per site. So what is a bore log data? It is basically the structure of the soil to up to six meters. We will know at every level up to six meters what is the soil made up? What is the resistivity of the soil? And how we can, based on that, we can design how to design the best earthing. Now for the existing site, resistance value of at least one earth pit for last 12 months with electro type and size and the ground enhancement compound that has been used. So this is the data that we require. And of course the details and the flood current ratings of all the equipment that has to be earthed. This is very important. What are the basic components that are required for an earthing system? You must be knowing this also. Earthing electrodes, which can be either rods or pipes or strips or plates. Then we have the interconnecting material, which are the strips, the conductors. Soil resistivity improvement material, which many of you are still using salt and charcoal and then chemical compounds. Joining accessories, which can be clamps or exothermic welding kits, and earth inspection chambers, earth pit inspection chambers, which can be a plastic or cement ready to be used, or maybe the brickwork is done on site. Well, we manufacture most type of earthing electrodes. But our recommendation on the type of earthing electrode which should be used is always site specific. As you can see from this table, it depends on the condition of the soil at the site. If the resistivity of the soil is low, say less than 10 ohm meters, it means that it is very severely corrosive. Now, can we use a GI pipe or a 17.2 dia? upper bonded earth rod here? No, of course we cannot. It will get corroded within a very short span of time. Therefore, for severely corrosive soil conditions such as these, we recommend a CI or cast iron pipe electrode of at least 13 mm wall thickness or a 250 microns copper bonded earth rod of 40 mm diameter minimum. Of course, for acidic or marine soil conditions, SS316L is the best bet. So we have even a pipe in pipe we have supplied in SS316L, which has given a very, very long life to where they have been installed. Now you uh, like to make, you know, uh, take note of the difference. Now many people say GI, we have installed GI and hot dip galvanized. What is the difference? The thickness of zinc plated pipes which are readily available in the market is about 40 to 60 microns only. This is the GI pipes or GI plates that you get. Now, we don't use these pipes. Our electrodes are hot galvanized and hence they have a zinc plating thickness of uh, between 80 to 120 microns. Secondly, when a GI pipe is cut to the required length, the cut surface area goes does not have the zinc coating on it and the corrosion will start from there i think you are all aware of this as it is if it is left in that condition our earthing electrodes are hot dip galvanized after the fabrication process is completed so the inner pipe the inner cavity and the outer pipe the top terminal of the pipe in pipe are already are all hot dip galvanized after they have been fabricated and welded now this of course will increase the cost to some extent but it definitely increases the quality and the life of the electrodes. Now we have, we make pipe in pipe uh, electrodes or strip in pipe just to give you a small brief. There are many uh, pipe in pipe or strip in pipe manufa electrode manufacturers in the market. What is our USP that makes them unique from the others? Well, look at the size of the top plate, connection plate. Now for the 76 OD pipe, this plate is uh, 50 mm width and 25 mm thickness. No other manufacturer has this. Now why have we kept this? Well, we all know that the current carrying capacity of any electrode, it depends on its cross-section area, isn't it? 
So if the cross section area of both the inner and the outer pipe together is X, then the top plate must also match this area. Otherwise, it will sort of create a bottleneck for the fault current to flow. A 76 uh, mm OD into 3 meters lead PIP, a pipe in pipe, you know, they have, it has been successfully tested at CPRI for a fault current rating of 65 kiloamps for one second. Now, similarly, all our other pipe in pipe and earth rods have been successfully tested at CPRI. Now, the other feature is what I already told you in the previous slide, which, which is that they are hot dip galvanized after fabrication. But whether they are hot dip galvanized or copper plated in our own plant, both the inner primary electrode and the outer secondary electrode are plated to the thickness ordered by our customers. So if you want 100 microns, we will give you both the inner and outer electrodes in 100 microns. If you want 250 microns, both the inner and outer electrodes are 250 microns, which sad to say many people are not doing that. So let us see, many people ask us this question, which surface treatment is better? Is, it, is galvanizing better or is copper plating better? Well, these are actual photos from a fourth rod from a study conducted by uh, the uh, NEGRP, that is a National Electrical Grounding Research Project in U.S. They conducted it for, uh, from 19, uh, for 10 years. The objective was to compare the long-term performance of different types of electrodes. They buried different types of electrodes in different types of soils, and it was clearly seen that the copper bonded rods lasted longer than the galvanized rod. You can see the corrosion on the galvanized rod after 10 years, whereas the copper bonded rod is really intact. These are just some types of interconnecting materials that can be used, copper strips, bare copper cables, insulated copper cables, you must be knowing all about this. And these are some applications of the, to connect the electrodes to the grip, you know, different types of copper, insulator, uh, GI is used. Adjoining accessories, they come in three types. We have three types of these. The first are the mechanical fittings, which are basically different types of clamps with uh, screws or bolts. Then we have the compression connectors, which are fitted by using a crimping tool. And then we have exothermic welding, which is used for joining conductors now which is good which is bad from this once again there has been a study let us see what it is first of all let's have a look at this let us compare the three types of joining accessories where has the mechanical fittings uh, fitted using screws or bolts there's a lot of air gaps as can be seen which is not desirable in any electrical connection and this leads to failure of joints even in the compression connectors you can see that there is some amount of air gap even after crimping. You can see that here. Okay. Now, this will be more if the right crimping tools or, uh, are not used or if the person doing the crimping does not have good skill. But have a look at the exothermic welded joint. There are no air gaps, absolutely. But there have been further studies done in the US about this. I'll just show you about what have they done. Now, this is a study has been done at uh, Ontario Hydro Technologies from 1995 to 1996 on different type of grounding function as per the IEEE 87 standard. They compared mechanical compression and exothermic welded connectors. Now, these were the results of this test. They, these are the manufacturer, the joint type, and the pictures of the products. This is in their report. Well, you can see, let us see the mechanical pullout test. One rod, uh, that is the mechanical, mechanical clamp failed, and also a compression connector failed over there. Four out of four rods failed there. Now in the electromagnetic force test, again, three mechanical and six compression connectors connections failed. Now in the alkaline, in the acid test, four mechanical and seven compression connections fail. 
and in the last test that is the alkaline series test four mechanical and 12 compression connections failed but all the exothermic welded connections passed all the tests now based on these results that the exothermic welded connections are superior to mechanical and compression connections now what are the advantages of exothermic welding i'm sure you are already using this in the railway it is metallically fused it is electrically continuous there are no air gaps like shown in that image over this previously it can carry more current than the conductors at times it is permanent hence no regular maintenance like tightening of bolts and nuts it will not corrode loosen or fuse and it is very difficult to tamper with well hex has exothermic welding under the brand name of hex weld we can provide comprehensive solutions for the railways in exothermic welding besides having our own exothermic welding units manufacturing units hex also has a tie up with fast weld of brazil for providing technological support in exothermic welding so we any there's a difficulty somewhere we can and we are not able to do it we refer it to them and they help us to solve the problem let's go on to soil treatment a clause 14.5 of i triple e states that it is often impossible to achieve the desired reduction in ground resistivity by adding more grade conductors or ground rods but as an alternate solution various types of soil conductivity improvement materials can be used and now sub clause a states that salts can be used to do this but it's also cautious of its disadvantages due to leaching and regular maintenance that is required now sub clause b states that bentonite can be used now this also has its disadvantages as it needs water to maintain its reliable characteristics now sub clause c states that chemical filled pipes with holes to allow the chemicals to leach out can be used along with treatment of the soil surrounding the electrode and sub clause d states that ground enhancement materials with various values of self resistivity can be used to improve the soil surrounding the electrode now these are what are called as maintenance free earths now hex we manufacture a wide range of ground enhancing chemical compounds now terec plus is this one here the first bag terec plus this is a carbon based compound manufactured by us but the formula for this is from dual mason of france its self resistivity is 0.2 this can be used for all soil conditions but we normally recommend it for harsh rocky soil conditions and where it has proved uh, itself to be satisfactory for customers mr stanley yes sir just one sir. yes sir uh, actually abhi aap jo bol rahe the na usme thoda sa wo ho gaya tha aapka network problem aa gaya tha so can you repeat this slide once again please yes sure 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 okay thank you thank well, you well repeating what i said earlier for those who did not catch it we have a manufacturing unit for a wide range of ground enhancement chemical compounds the first one here this small bag of 5 kg is terec plus now this is a carbon based compound manufactured by us but the formula for this has been given to us by uh, dual mason of france now its self resistivity of this compound is 0.2 ohm meter but it can reduce the resistivity of the surrounding soil by 75% approximately now this can be used for all soil conditions but we recommend it to be used mostly in harsh or rocky soil conditions where it has proved itself to the satisfaction of our customers then we have earth corn which comes in a 12.5 kg pack um, this is a blend of bentonite and carbon and 
it has been tested for a self resistivity of 0 0.098 ohm meter and it can be used in most soil conditions very effectively we have used it it reduces the surrounding soil resistivity by about 65 percent then we have terra pro terra hex and terra knight which have the capability of reducing the soil resistivity by approximately 60 percent 55 percent and 50 percent respectively but we would like to offer to the rail railways terra pro which meets all the rvso specs now all these compounds have been formulated after many years of r d in a lab now these are three tanks which are filled with bentonite the earth corn compound and the terric plus compound since november 2011 well we can see the effect of bentonite without any moisture the result in a lot of cracking earth corn and terric plus have been stable till date without any moisture added to them so this is the result of a lot of r d that we do from our side we also have done a long-term test study along with CPRI of Bangalore in two earth pits. Now, one was filled with Terec Plus and the other with a conventional salt and charcoal in 2008. The resistance value till May 2017 are given in this table. This black line here is of Terec Plus, which shows a very, very stable performance. And the red line is of the conventional Salt and charcoal earth pit, which shows a very, very erratic behavior in its resistance values. The hex also has ready to use concrete and polymer earth pit chambers. Now, these are our chambers made from concrete. We have six sizes in all of the square shape and one in the round shape. All the square chambers have been tested successfully for a load bearing capacity or LPC of 5 tons, whereas a round uh, uh, chamber has uh, passed a uh, LPC of 3 tons. This was a customer requirement, so it was built accordingly. Uh, even the standard uh, that is IEC 62561-7, which governs this, uh, these uh, chambers, states that it has to pass 3 tons. Now, by using these chambers, you can save crucial time in building chambers using bricks and cement and concrete. The most have a, a ready-to-use chambers. Now, these are in square shape and two in round shape. The smaller sizes of the square chambers have been tested successfully for five tons and the bigger sizes for three tons. These are manufactured from high-grade polypropylene for high strength. They also stabilize again UV degradation by sunlight and they are also non-brittle. As they are lightweight, they can be transported very easily. They also have been tested successfully as per IEC 65-7. This is just a few pictures of uh, Well, we have another unique product called the electric chamber from the ground. Really designed to suit uh, our lots uh, of various just, just, one, just one minute, Mr. Stanley. Yes, sir. Again, there was some issue with your network. So, can you repeat the slide once again? The same one or the previous one? Previous one also. Okay. This one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, these are ready to use polymer earth pit chambers. Am I audible now? Is it clear? Now it is clear. Okay, sir. Now, we have five sizes types in square shape. Some with a nylon lid or a polymer lid, I would say. And some with a cast iron lid. HEPM is a, with a cast iron lid, metal cover. Now, the smaller sizes, this is HEP, HEPS and HEPM have been tested for a load bearing capacity of five tons, whereas HEPA and HEPB have passed a three ton load bearing capacity. Both our round 
earth pit chambers, polymer earth pit chambers have been tested successfully for high LVC. Now, these are manufactured from high grade polypropylene PP for high strength. They are stabilized from UV degradation by sunlight and they are non brittle. As they are lightweight, they can be transported very easily. And they are all tested successfully as per IC62561 7. Moving on, now, these are a few pictures of the installations at various sites using these chambers. Now we have also Hex has a unique product called Earth Seals. What are Earth Seals? These seals are used wherever there's a possibility of water entering the inspection chamber from below the ground. Now Hex, these seals are designed you know, to suit specific earth rods from half inch to three fourth inch. Now they have been successfully tested to withstand a pressure of five bar as per IEC 62561-7. Sorry, the standard is mentioned wrong in the slide. It should be IEC 62561, okay? These seals are used along with hex earth pit chambers. Now let's see a little bit more about them. These are the two applications where we have used earth seals. The first in this drawing is where the water table is very high. And the second application is for earth pits which are made in basements, especially in a lot of malls being built or, you know, but these are used over there. But to understand this product, better you know and online i'll just show you a small uh, animated video uh, without any uh, audio so just have a look i will i will give you a small audio along with that to begin with you know the installation of dugout quit for the basement is ready and this is covered with a damp proof membrane the rebar mesh is also ready start the installation by marking the cutout at the Location on the proof membrane and it accordingly. The membrane is then on the membrane. Once up is tightened and you install the seal pipe. Which is then inserted. You uh, see the seal uh, pipe uh, is not uh, inserted to the membrane. Yes, sir. Uh, again, uh, yes. your network problem was there, so you have to repeat uh, this. Uh, okay. Uh, this uh, video. I'm sorry about this. Uh, sir, you you okay, made a video, video, sir. Um, uh, I think that there is no problem. Uh, Hello. Sir, you, uh, you can stop your video, sir. Okay. Okay, then I want. So this was the last video. Actually, there are no more videos. Anna, uh, oh, when the, the, some camera, presentation camera. was there, also some problem was coming. So you can keep okay. your video off so that. Okay. I'll move on to the next slide. Then. All right. If anybody has any questions, I will explain about it later. Well, it, we are. No, uh, no, 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 please. Uh, actually, I'm saying about your video. Uh, your camera, sir, camera. Your camera, camera. Camera. Okay, okay, sorry. Not sir. about okay. the presentation. Uh, all, right, all right, I misunderstood. Sorry, sir. All right. Uh, please, isko chala Okay, okay, okay. Okay, fine. Let us try again now. Well, this is the installation video of the Earth Seals. Let us see how it is done. Once the dugout is ready for the basement and it is covered with membrane, the rebar is already in place. Start the installation by marking the cutout on the required location of the damp proof membrane and cutting it accordingly. The membrane is then the membrane seal is then fitted on the membrane and it is tightened. Have a look at this. One part goes below the membrane and the nut is on, tightens the, the seal to the damp proof membrane now the, after it is tightened to the required tightness the seal tube is then inserted into the membrane seal 
If you see the cross section that will be coming up, you can see that it is sealed water tight. You have seals here, here, and here at three locations, so the water cannot enter. Then we move on to the top part of the seal assembly. The top flange is opened up. And it is placed on top of the seal pipe. The earth pit chamber is then placed on the top of the, uh, the top flange and it is locked into place using a nut. We can then just pass on the pipe through which the conductor will be coming, which will be connected to the earth rod. The earth rod is then driven through the earth pit and into the bottom seal into the ground. And the seal pack is opened up and it is placed into the slot that has been designed for these seals. Now these seals effectively will seal the earth rod and will not allow any water to come into the earth pit chamber. This is then tightened into place. Once this is done, you can see the seals are all in place here. After this, we connect the conductor, the strip to the earth rod, and then we close the inspection pit. It could be a different type of chamber with a hinge lid or whatever we have with us. Once it is kept in proper level with the top of the ground, the top of the basement, we pour in the concrete and the earth pit chamber is in place in a watertight installation. So this is, now we have made many improvements since this video and the seal designs may be different. They may not be as what is shown in the, you know, in this video. This was just uh, to give you an idea of how earth seals should be used. So well, moving on. What can HEX do? So HEX has the capability to undertake the following activities. We designed the earthing for all the lighting protection system for any new project, or we can audit the existing plant capacity for the adequacy of earthing and lighting protection systems according to the relevant standards. Then we submit our report with recommendations for how to improve or to get it as per the applicable standards. Of course, we manufacture and supply the products for the earthing and lighting protection system. And we also install and commission the earthing and lightning protection system. So this is what X offers to you, what we can do, what we have been doing. Some of our very, very uh, esteemed customers in various sectors, defense, we supply to MES, DEL, DRDO, Air Force, Naval Surveillance, Power sector, NPCIL, MACCTL, many, many. Just have a look. For solar, we have approximately covered 6,000 megawatt projects span India with our lighting protection systems. Some of our other clients and approvals which we have from them, um, we, we can see Den over there, CAPE, OBO. Many, many other earthing suppliers, PACS, Razdani, ABB, Adani, we are suppliers to all these, all these customers. Well, just sharing some of the results of some of our projects. NPCI Kaiga, where we did the earthing and got a value of 0.5 ohms and 55.5.29. Five, five, very, very minimal values. BACS Rasdani power 0 0.05 ohms. They were having a big problem with their substations. What can we offer? Now, what do we have as far, as far as Indian railway approvals are concerned? We have been already approved for cable lux from MCF and the approval from RDSO for, for our earthing is under progress. So this is the status of our relationship with railways. Now just presenting some of our installations. 
This is the EAC light refreshing system where we installed seven EAC system to cover the whole plant at of Tyson Group in uh, Pune. Then Moil, a very, very big, big organization, Navratta company, where we have supplied five or six light protection system, which are protecting their mines, the open cast mines. We also install conventional wherever required. This is for Mahindra solar plant transformer in Andhra Pradesh. the Indian and protected using our ESE lightning protection systems. We also conducted an audit for the MACTCL substation earthing where there were 200 earth pits. We went and measured each and every earth pit, the grid. We gave our report. Now we are in the process of uh, implementing the, whatever we have, the solutions that we have given them. And they in turn have uh, rewarded us by asking us to audit another 27 substations. Improvement in earthing for the Shiva Sundaram Hydro Power Station, where they were getting a very high resistance value, where we brought it down to less than 0.5. This was uh, what I mentioned in the report for BACS Rajdhani, where we got a 0.05 resistance value. Earthmat supplied for the Hyderabad Metro Station along with the ES. This is EAC lightning systems here, here protecting all the cable cars. So a very challenging project for us, but we accomplished it. Well, we are also very happy to be part of the lightning resilience in their campaign. Under this program, we have installed 457 lightning arresters in 457 villages. They are being protected as under this lightning resi resilient in their campaign. Just recently from April to June 2021 in the Gachiroli region of Maharashtra. The total number of EAC lightning arresters installed by a still date are approximately 6,000 numbers. Of course, after all the hard work, we are you know, very glad to be rewarded by it. The government of India is a leading performer in exports right from 2003 to 2004. Now, this is the award for uh, export excellence being given by our ex president, Mr. Pranab Mukherjee, who was then the Minister of External Affairs. Now, ex directors Manish Desai and our late director, Mr. Mahesh Mehta, receiving the award for export excellence for 2010 11 from the late Mr. Manohar Parikar who was then the CM of Goa. And these are some more photos of our various other awards. And this is Mr. Piyush Goel giving us the award, the Railway Minister. Well, to summarize, HEX is one of the world's leading manufacturer of cable termination systems and earthing and lightning protection systems. Number eight in the world, number seven, number eight in the world. We have in-house manufacturing facilities and our products are made to national and international standards. Hence, we have overall control over the quality, the delivery and the pricing of our products. Now, HEX has a vast bouquet of range of products to suit your requirements. We also have the infrastructure to make customized product and the financial condition of the group is very, very strong. This not only ensures stability, but else also ensures that further expansion of facilities can be done whenever required. Well, that is comes to the end of our presentation. Um, these are the contact numbers. My number, my email is given. You can also contact Mr. Somnath, who is our marketing manager. This is his email address and his phone number. So you have any queries, you can call us or write to us. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much and stay safe. I will now stop sharing and you can ask us a question which we will try to answer as best as possible. If we cannot answer them right now, we will get back to you at a later stage and send in our answers. Thank you very much. 
Mr. Garg, you can continue now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stanley, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, now, first of all, I request all the uh, participants. So if any questions, uh, you can ask. Please. Uh, sir, some questions uh, have been already sent uh, in the registration sheet. So first, uh, of so if, uh, if these are, uh, if uh, I have questions, if they are present, they can ask directly. Okay, sir. Yes, Joe, we are just a There is not an issue. I will try to answer. Other members of our team are also they are design members. Are there. If I cannot answer, then maybe they will also try to answer. Okay, Vakankar ji, you can read questions one by one. Okay, sir. I will, I will share the sheet that question sheet and I will read it. Okay. Uh, sir, the first question is uh, asked by uh, Mr. Muru M. Murugan. Uh, the, uh, actually, he asked about distance between two, uh, two Earth bits. Yes, yes. That's a very important question. Sorry, I missed it out. The distance between two Earth bits has to be equal to or more than the length of the electrode. If the electrode is two meters, then the distance between two Earth bits should be at least two meters or more. If it is three meters, the distance between two earth bits must be at least three meters or more. Okay, sir. The next question is uh, the next question is the uh, about installation. Okay, I, I will read. I can see the. I will. Yes, I can see yes, the slide. Yes, I will. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, sir. okay sir. In MSDSC installation, every detection point have a earthing, but in point crossover, DP earthing not possible. Also, less than one ohm is not possible in single earthing. What can I do if not achieve? Yes, this also is a very uh, general question. Many people tell us, uh, less than one ohm lana hai. Why, how can you do that if the resistivity is very high? My best earthing compound, along with all the earth pits, all the earth rods, and other things that I use. The uh, best uh, earth enhancing compound that I have can re uh, reduce the soil resistivity by about 75%. So it all depends on the design. It was all the variables that are there. We will design and tell you whether you have to use one earth pit or two earth pit or three earth pits, and then the depth and the quantity of backfill compound. Now, these backfill compound, what I shared with you, uh, we also use them in combination. It's not necessary to use only Terec Plus or only Earthcon or only uh, Terra Pro or Terra Hex. We can use them in combination to uh, get the desired result and keeping in mind the economics also of scale. So this is what we do in our design department. We give you the best solution. So if you this is uh, if you send me the specifics, we can design and uh, give you a solution to this. I'm moving on to the next one. Explain more about the zone protection in LPS. How many zones are considered while installing a lightning protection system? Some light on this topic would be really helpful. Yes. Now, there are both the standards, that is IEC 62305 and NFC 17. Both state that uh, there are four lightning protection zones, one, two, three, and four. Now, how are these zones defined? They are defined, as I said in the presentation, it is based on the intensity of the lightning, the number of thunderstorm days. So based on this, we will design, we will first of all categorize in which zone does the site fall under. What are the number of thunderstorm days in that region based on the GPAGI report? If you see the report, there is a huge table. Okay, I will show you. Let me see if I have the table here. I can share it with you just a minute. Uh, sir, uh, should I uh, uh, stop this hearing? No, just a minute, just a minute. I'm just checking. Uh, okay. Then I'll tell you to stop. I have the global report, annual report. Sorry, just a minute. Yeah.
Okay, I'll just uh, just allow me to share, please. Okay, okay. Uh, now you can share your screen. Yes. Well, this is the thunderstorm climate. Can you all see the screen? Uh, yes, sir. Sc screen is visible, but uh, not readable, sir. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, it's a report. It's in PDF. So, just zoom in. You can... This is the thunderstorm climate. Uh, climate show you the thunderstorm days so this is the table of thunderstorm days it covers the most of the regions in india so based on this table we know the number of thunderstorm days and therefore the intensity of lightning in that area now as i said in the presentation there are four lightning protection levels which are based on the lightning intensity the level one is from uh, just a minute, I will show you the presentation again. Uh, here it is. Level one, the peak current in a lightning strike is about 200 kiloamps, and the minimum current is 300 kiloamps. So this is lightning protection level one. Whereas lightning protection level two is the maximum peak current is 150 kiloamps, and the minimum current is five kiloamps. Level three, minimum is 10, maximum is 100, and level four, the minimum current is 16 kiloamps, and the maximum current again is 100. So this is what defines the four levels of lightning protection system, lightning protection levels. Is that clear? Hello? Yeah, please go ahead, Mr. Yeah, so that, that was uh, the answer to that question. Can I, I just uh, stop sharing so you can show me the next question. Can you share the next question or read it out? Uh, yes, yes, I'm sharing. Yes, sir. Uh, question number uh, the fourth. Fourth. From, you can start from question number four. Yeah. Why static charge develop on metallic body in electronic equipment room? Whether electronic equipment generate leakage current to go into ground? How can we take the leakage current which is flowing through ground wire, which is correct or due to any fault? I'm sorry. At this Point, I will not be able to answer this question, but I will get back to you. All right. We're moving on to the next one. Uh, please clarify before installation of earth, is there any standard instruction to measure soil resistivity? What we use is the four point venom method mostly to measure the soil resistivity. So, this is what you can use. How to solve the increase, the issue of increase in resistivity as the time passes? 
Now, the resistivity depends on the moisture and the temperature. But after a certain temperature and moisture content, it, it stabilizes. So this is what the standard says. But it will change. It cannot be stable all the time. As the uh, water content in the, in the soil reduces and the temperature increases, the resistivity increases. So we have to take the resistivity at the, you know, the worst level, that is uh, in summer months. Normally, whenever we are called to audit, we tell them that it is the best time to do, maybe during April, May. So that is the time, March, April, May, where we like to conduct the audit so we get the best results. What is the proper method to maintain the resistivity of earth when the time passes more than five years? But I don't know what you are using for as a backfill compound. Are you using salt and charcoal? Salt and charcoal degrade very fast. They also require a, a topping after six months or so, depending on the condition of the soil. But if you use a, a good back, now I spoke to you about bentonite. You know, people are selling a backfill compound. They're just selling bentonite at very cheap rates. People are very happy customers that, yes, it is a backfill compound, but you don't know what it contains. And so after a certain period of time, they get back to us saying this is what has happened. And when we test, we see that it is just plain bentonite that has been installed. Okay, so be very careful when you're using backfill compounds. So one that is backfill compound is actually a very, very important component of the earthing system, which helps to maintain the resistivity. Like I said, we have done the study at CPRI for our Terec Plus. Since so many years, it has been very, very stable. I hope that answers your question. Then uh, number so, Mr. eight. Mr. Stanley, uh, just yes. my question. So yes, what kind of compound you will suggest so that we can have a good uh, this, uh, resistance, earth resistance? Sir, it all depends even after, on... five, even after five years. Yes, it all depends on the existing soil conditions, the soil resistivity. What is the structure of the soil? Is it rocky? Is it clay? Is it normal soil? All this data has to be taken into account when you design your lightning protection system, sorry, your earthing system, and it will last for at least five to 10 years without any problem. So this is what we have been giving to customers. At least for five to six years, we have not had any problem till now of any site that has been uh, uh, where the earthing has been done by us. So it has to be designed. You, I can't just tell you use this. Of course, I can tell you use Terec Plus because I know it is suited for all. But I also know it is one of the most expensive compounds. So I don't want to give you an expensive compound just for the sake of selling it to you. What we would like to give you is to design. Once again, I'm using the term the optimum or the best compound along with all the other components of the earthing system that will give you your desired value that you require. And that should last for a long period of time. Now, there have been many cases where we had gone to a site, a company. Uh, the soil condition was very, very acidic because of their product. Okay, the water was leaking into the ground and all their earthing electrodes were getting corroded within a span of three to four months. They would just disappear. There were no earthing electrodes left because the ground water was contaminated by that acid that they were releasing. So when we went there and we studied the problem and we told them this is what we could, we gave them a very, very unique solution. Of course, we used SS316L pipe in pipe electrodes, which have there not been any complaints till date. This is about two years back now. So we can provide you solutions. There are other very, very unique solutions that we have provided. You come to us with your problem, we will design and we will tell you this is the best that can be done. If it cannot be done, also we will tell you. But we will not fool you and say, yes, we can do everything. We can provide any earthquake which uh, you ask for one home, we will give you. No, we don't do that. That's not the way we operate. Okay, thank you. Well, the next question, can we move on? What is the minimum? Yes, sir. What is the minimum distance from OHE mast to an earth pit? Well, um, it depends, I would say. It depends on so many things. There is uh, no minimum. What is the, what is the 
uh, overhead electric mast, what is the current flow in it? Normally, whenever there is a, a, a what should I say, a high voltage cable that is passing, first of all, you have to be very careful of the currents that can be induced from there. But this is all taken into the calculation. But offhand, I cannot tell you right now what exactly it should be. Okay. I will get back to you on that. Give me some more details so I can get back to you on that. Are there any more questions? Any further question, please? Sir, in the chat box, there are some questions. I'll see some more questions. Sir. Uh -huh. Uh, sir, uh, this uh, the questions are visible. Yes, questions. We have already answered these questions. Okay. Anyway, if there are any more questions, Anything. please forward them to uh, me. Just, just one second. There is one question from uh, Mr. Ravi Shankar Mishra. What is the standard method of earth resistance measurement? Well, you can, uh, we you know, sometimes use a clamp meter, clamp on meter to measure the earth, uh, the resistance value of the earth pit or the grid. This is the fastest method. You can either isolate it or there are inframeters which we use, we use which can do this. There are now megas that are available which you can measure the individual earth pit without disconnecting it to get the earth pit resistance value. And we are going to purchase it very soon. Okay, Mr. Stanley, one more question. Yeah. Uh, suppose uh, uh, this my earth is uh, present at uh, uh, higher uh, higher than the ground level, say 10 to 12 meter high. Okay. Then how to provide the proper earthing in that case? Your earthing is higher than the ground level. Yeah. So what is suppose the in hilly areas? Suppose in hilly oh. areas. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it becomes in, difficult to achieve very low value of earth resistance. Then what should we do? No, is it a rocky area? Ah, rocky area. Okay, so uh, is it possible to dig over? Is it possible to dig an earth pit, vertical earth pit, or can you have a horizontal earth pit? Where the conductors or earth electrodes can be installed horizontally. You know, you can try to uh, provide an earth mat over. Is it possible to put an earth mat? We have done this at times just to provide an earth mat of a particular size to get the required value. We cannot we cannot dig uh, vertically because of the uh, the area, the you know, the geographical conditions of the area. So we have gone horizontally. <laughs> So if you cannot do vertically, the answer is to go horizontally. Earth electro should be provided horizontally? Yes. At least at least uh, 0.6 meters below the ground. Uh, have you implemented this uh, somewhere? Yes, we have done this. We have used Tenec Plus to reduce the earth uh, resistivity value. We have used electrodes. We have tried to go with, as uh, you know, uh, depending on the terrain, what at least minimum 0.5 to 0.6 meters, and we have installed. 
And what was the earth resistance value in that case? Um, the earth resistance value, if I remember correctly, that we achieved it somewhere around 10, 10 ohms. That was uh, we could achieve. Uh, so 10 ohms is very, very high. Yes, but it was it was very high. The resistivity was very, very high. So the customer was satisfied because they tried many other things and they you know, couldn't get it less than that. We told them this is the best we could do. Because of the space constraint, constraint and other things. But this is something what we have done. Okay, thank you. Uh, so two more questions are there. Uh, question number nine and ten. Uh, what minimum between electrical earth pit to perimetric earth pit? What is a perimetric earth pit? What is perimetric earth pit? Is uh, something on the perimeter? सर जो क्वेश्चन पूछा है वो उन्होंने वो अगर हो तो थोड़ा क्लियर क्लेरिफाई कीजिए मिस्टर भोलेंद्र कुमार सर भोलेंद्र कुमार बोल रहा हूँ मैट्रिक अर्थ जो है उसके जो अपना इलेक्ट्रिकल का अर्थ होकर होता है जो एसी पैनल होता है उससे बीच डिस्टेंस कितने होते होंगे जी वाट डिस्टेंस अच्छा ओके ओके वाट डिस्ट are you asking what is the distance from the wall? Mr. No. Mendes, he is asking that what is the minimum distance between electrical earth bed, uh, earth bed which we are providing for uh, so that, electric. Like I, I said earlier, the distance between any two earth pits has to be equal to or more than the length, the length of the electrode. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, please continue. Please continue. Yeah, this is this is the same question. It has been it is repeated. The distance between two earth pits, any two earth pits, has to be more than the length of the electrode, equal to or more than the length of the earthing electrode. Uh, have you got your answer, Mr. Bulinder? सर आपको मिल गया आंसर या और कुछ पूछना चाह रहे हैं इसमें सर सर ओके नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन प्लीज व्हाट इज द मिनिमम डिस्टेंस बिटवीन इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स अर्थिंग इक्विपमेंट अर्थिंग सिस्टम एंड हाई पावर ग्रिड अर्थिंग सिस्टम सो व्हाट इज द अर्थिंग सिस्टम आर यू टॉकिंग अबाउट हियर Is there any specific earthing system, or it is just again earth rods? Hello. What is the type of earthing system? Yeah. Are you present, Mr. Madla? Uh, Agar please... present hai, aap apna question directly put sakte. Is he present? I think he is present. Yes. Yes, so a cover plate system, I think he is done. Hello. 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 Anji, sir. So these are a copper plate system, I think he is done. Okay. So, so what is the size uh, of the copper plate? What is the size of the copper plate? Size of three hundred by three hundred, three hundred mm, three hundred. So this is for this is for the electronics equipment thing or for the power grid thing. What are you? 
What is the system for the high power grid? I think that you are talking about. The high power is 132 kV. So, it's on the Okay. So, have you, is the thing installed or your RCV that it has to be installed? What is to be installed there? It tells you that what is the safety side, safety side distance could I maintain? See, again, it is really the same. There is no, no difference. There's no difference. Whatever is the the length of, of the electrode, the separation between any two electrodes has to be at least equal to the length. Equal or more than? Yeah, equal or more than, exactly. Okay, okay thank you. Any other questions, sir? Uh, yes, one more question. I um, I will show you. Okay. Yeah, how to check whether the lightning arrester is working or not? Well, you just have to check the continuity. Now, these are all mechanical instruments. The conventional lighting arrester is a mechanical. The ESC Taran is a second generation, which is again mechanical. Now, this has no system to check whether it is working. You have to connect a cable to the top tip of the lightning arrester and connect it to the earthing and see if there's any continuity there. So that is the way we check it. Whereas for Satellite 3, it has its own tele-tester. The tele-tester can be used to check whether Satellite 3, because it has got electronics inside it. Uh, Prabhat, are you there? DST construction? Prabhat? Uh, not for the next question. What is that class A protection? No, uh, my, my question is that he, how to check uh, whether it's working or not. And yes. Other thing is, other thing I, I want to ask. Yes, tell me. Other thing I want to, other thing I want to ask that. Hello. Hello. Is there any counter for that? He there's some incre in increment. Uh, from that we can get some information that lightning has occurred and it has been satisfactorily grounded. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, there are lightning strike counters that can be installed. You have analog, you have digital. Both are there. We have both in our range. We can you know and install that. If the lightning has struck any lightning arrester, it can be, uh, it will be shown on the lightning strike counter. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anybody want to ask the questions, please ask. You can ask. Uh, if you have any question, you can ask Prabhat, are there? Any further questions, please? Anyway, if there are no further questions, don't worry, you can send them to us later. Okay, we will be glad to answer all your questions. Okay, Pakankar ji, you, you can conclude now. Okay, sir. Okay, I am sharing a link for feedback. You can give your, all, all of you can give the feedback through that link. 
I am providing in the, it in the chat box. Okay, so on the behalf of Chemtech Gwalior, I really thankful to Mr. Stanley for giving such a wonderful presentation on earthing and lightning system and uh, giving a detailed overview that how this uh, lightning takes place and how using these equipments uh, we can avoid such kind of uh, mishaps. So it was a very wonderful uh, presentation. I sincerely thank you, Mr. Stanley, for this presentation. And also, I am very much thankful to all the participants for joining this webinar. Again, uh, on the next week of, that is coming Friday, again, we are having another webinar on this LTE network by Ericsson at the same time, that is 3 p.m. So once again, on the behalf of Camtech and Indian Railways, I thank you, Mr. Stanley, for this wonderful representation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Garg. On behalf of X, I thank each and everyone who has taken part in this webinar. We do hope that you have uh, we have been able to give you some information that, I, that has been useful to you from this presentation. Well, uh, we would be glad to hear the feedback that you give us so that we can improve in the future and provide solutions to you, uh, railways, you know, uh, in the uh, very, very uh, near time to come. You'll be part of the Indian Railway family for supplying earthing and lightning systems to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.